Good evening, everyone. Welcome to NTD Tonight. I'm David Zhang. Here is a preview of some of today's top stories. From tragedy to recovery, owners of a bowling alley in Maine make plans to reopen months after a shooting. Former President Trump returns to the courthouse for his case against E. Jean Carroll. More on the latest in his ongoing trial. We'll take a closer look at the results of the Iowa and New Hampshire primary elections. A presidential historian analyzes some historical moments. First up, in Maine, business owners defy tragedy and decide to reopen their bowling alley months after a shooting that killed 18 people. NTD's Stephanie Sikal has the story. The October 25th shooting that took the lives of 18 people in a bowling alley and bar in Lewiston, Maine, left the owners convinced that their establishment would remain permanently closed. But now, three months later, they reached a different conclusion. They felt compelled to reopen due to the overwhelming support they received from their families, the Lewiston community, and people across the country. I've been reading a lot of messages from people, including the deaf community asking me, you know, to reopen. They want me to open. And uh, I finally decided that I have to reopen. I just can't open at that location. The community kept asking us and we knew um, that everybody kind of needed it. You know, it was a place where, or it is a place where people get to come together and spend time with friends and family or create friends and family. A 69-year-old employee who intends to come back is recognized for saving at least four or five children on that night. I saw the kids running down towards me, so I ran up to the kids. And I got behind them and got them thrown back through the door. And as I turned to go through the door is when he shot me. Just in time, Recreation is aiming to reopen in March or April. Meanwhile, Schmaggy's Bar and Grill is still finalizing details regarding when and where their establishment will reopen. Stephanie Sakal, NTD News. Now let's take a look at other top headlines. Peter Navarro, former White House advisor to former President Donald Trump, was sentenced today. Navarro has been convicted of contempt of Congress. He was found guilty of defying a subpoena for documents in a deposition from the House January 6th committee. He had this to say before entering the courthouse today. The uh, United States versus Peter Navarro has turned out to be a very important landmark constitutional case that is going to resolve important issues about the constitutional separation of powers as well as uh, the integrity, uh, efficiency of presidential decision-making. Prosecutors are asking a judge to sentence Peter Navarro to six months behind bars and impose a $200,000 fine. Navarro has vowed to appeal the verdict, saying he couldn't cooperate with the committee because Trump had invoked executive privilege. A judge barred him from making that argument at trial. Justice Department prosecutors accused Navarro of trying to, quote, hide behind claims of privilege. But defense attorneys said that Trump did claim executive privilege and put Navarro in a, quote, untenable position. He is the second Trump aide to face contempt of Congress charges. Former White House advisor Steve Bannon was convicted of two counts and was sentenced to four months behind bars but has been free while appealing his conviction. The ongoing defamation trial between former President Trump and E. Jean Carroll. Trump showed up in court today, splitting his time between the campaign trail and the courthouse. Trump's legal team tried to challenge Carroll's claims that her safety was at risk as a result of former president's disparaging statements about her. E. Jean Carroll's longtime friend, Carol Martin, was called to testify. Martin regretted her earlier text messages in which she said Carol's narcissism had run amok. In another text exchange with her daughter, Martin wrote that Carol is like a drug addict and the drug is herself. Martin said on the stand today that she is very sorry about sending the messages and called herself a little hyperbolic. 
adding that it was a bad choice of words. Martin is a former local news anchor. District Judge Lewis Kaplan denied Trump's request to dismiss the case and barred Trump from denying the assault or claiming that Carroll made up the story. Carroll is seeking at least $10 million in damages. The current trial focuses on determining how much Trump should pay Carroll for defamation. Tensions on the rise between Texas and the Biden administration. Texas is defying orders to evacuate its National Guard from certain border areas. Officials around the U.S. are now picking sides in the ongoing battle. Multiple Democrats are calling on Biden to seize control of the Texas National Guard. Texas Congressman Joaquin Castro says POTUS needs to establish sole federal control of the Texas National Guard now. Democratic Congressman Greg Kazar, also from Texas, agrees with his colleague. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, meanwhile, says Texas is upholding the law while Biden is flouting it. Florida will keep assisting Texas with the personnel and assets. At the same time, in New York City, Mayor Eric Adams is asking for federal action again. Adams says his city can't deal with the immigration crisis on its own. Attentions are shifting to South Carolina after the New Hampshire primary. Nikki Haley says the one-on-one -on -one race with Trump is far from over. The Palmetto State voted her governor twice, but the current governor from her home state, Henry McMaster, and Senator Tim Scott have both endorsed Trump. The support for Trump with Republicans in South Carolina remains strong despite his legal troubles. Donald Trump, 200 percent. I'll be voting for Donald Trump. I think Trump's going to landslide. Light it. Yeah, I do. But among voters who favor Haley, there is growing concern that their votes won't matter in a month if people have a preconceived notion that Trump has already won. That is a fear. Like, get out and vote. Don't think he's already won, because I don't think he has. We'll bring you more election coverage as the race continues. We have seen some historical moments play out in the recent Iowa and New Hampshire primary elections. For more analysis on former President Trump's recent victories, NTD's David Lamb spoke with Jane Hampton Cook, a presidential historian and author of War of Lies. Jane Hampton Cook, thank you for joining me today. So uh, former President Donald Trump is the first non-incumbent since 1976 to win both Iowa and New Hampshire. Tell us about this historic win and the last time it happened. Are there any parallels? Well, certainly this is a very historic moment for Donald Trump and for the Republican Party because it's very rare for someone who's lost an election to come back and win again. And then you, in 1976, you had an incumbent with Gerald Ford, the sitting president, but you also had someone on the Democrat side, Jimmy Carter, who was the governor of Georgia, and he was out hustling and handshaking his opponents in the Democrat primary. And so he really sort of sprung out of nowhere. And for Donald Trump to now be, I think he's the third, uh, only he's won the New Hampshire primary three times. And I don't think that's happened before either. So it's a very historic win. He's really the comeback kid in the, in, at the moment because um, his supporters have galvanized around him and he's you know doing very, very well in these two early contests. And he did not win Iowa when he ran in 2016. And so I think that's a really important factor. It shows his strength among Republican Party voters. And so Trump is now largely considered the inevitable Republican nominee. And according to many polls, he has a good chance at winning against President Joe Biden in the general. So uh, Jane, when was the last time an incumbent lost a presidential election and then was reelected again second term like, has this happened before? It's happened one other time in American presidential history. So back in the 1880s, Grover Cleveland, he was a lot like Trump in that he was from New York, although he had been governor of New York. He became president. He was the first Democrat president since the Civil War. So that was really important. And he was really focused on labor and working and the, the working man. But he lost, after four years, his first term, he lost to Benjamin Harrison, who was a Republican. Harrison only had one term. He wasn't all that popular. And um, Cleveland beat him and came back to be the president again. In fact, when uh, Cleveland left office, his wife told the White House staff, we'll be back. 
So there was always a plan for Cleveland to try to come back, and he did. And that's the only other uh, time um, that we've had a president lose and then come back to win again. And so it certainly seems like that's the path that could happen with, with President Trump's return. Jane, what other historic elements could be at play in this year's election cycle? And please tell us more about those we've already seen so far. Well, you know, I think the fact that there's a lot of focus on President Biden's um, policies, people are unhappy, they're, they're unhappy with their own economic situation. Um, and that really, you know, it's the economy stupid was penned by a Bill Clinton uh, staffer. And so it really does kind of sometimes come down to the economy and how people are doing. But also people see a mental loss of competency in President Biden and people's um, confidence in him, just his ability just to do the job is low. And I think that's different. We really haven't seen that in a very, very long time. Um, and, you know, people took jabs at Ronald Reagan as he got older, but now we're, we're really seeing it in a negative way play out. And I think people are concerned. And I think that's another reason why people are gravitating toward President Trump again. All right, Jane Hampton Cook, presidential historian and author of War of Lies. Thank you so much for joining our show. Thanks for having me. We'll take a short break now, everybody, but here's a look at what we have for you when we come back. A woman went missing in Guatemala in October and the family is still looking for answers. Odd behavior by witnesses has still yet to be fully explained. A fake hit and run caught on camera. More details on the insurance scam attempt. Jim Harbaugh left the Michigan Wolverines as a college football champion. We'll bring you a closer look at his return to coach in the NFL. Those stories and more coming up on NTD tonight. Welcome back to NTD Tonight. I'm your host, David Zhang. A family of a woman who went missing in Guatemala more than three months ago said they're still trying to piece together what happened. Odd behavior by witnesses, conflicting information, and silence have been keeping them feeling left in the dark. NTD's Jason Blair speaks to the sister of the missing woman. After searching for answers in Guatemala, the family of a missing American woman feels like they still have more questions than answers. It's just very frustrating because even three months later, my family is searching for answers that we should have had on day one. 29-year-old Nancy Ng went missing in Guatemala in October while attending a yoga retreat. She was last seen in Lake Adelan on a rented kayak. She was with another woman when she disappeared. The kayak rental company said the yoga retreat group did not tell them about Miss Ng's disappearance and did not pay. And despite being scheduled to stay longer, they left the country within 12 hours. A company owner told ABC, quote, I just don't understand that part of leaving within eight hours, 12 hours of the accident. The woman with Miss Ng when she disappeared, Christina Blazik, claims to have filed a statement with police. However, the prosecutor investigating the case in Guatemala has yet to find the statement. An initial three-day search by Guatemalan authorities came up empty-handed. They believe missing drowned. The FBI did an investigation but is not able to reveal any details to the family or the public. However, they did state they are not aware of any foul play. Blazik, the only direct witness, spoke with the FBI but did not respond to requests from search teams to help with search efforts. She also has not spoken with Miss Ng's family after numerous requests. The family has been paying out of pocket for helicopter and underwater search efforts, but so far have not made much progress. They've said also that in their 20 plus years of experience, they've never had a witness to an accident not help, not offer information, and that this was just a very bizarre case. After a month of silence, Blazik spoke publicly through her attorney for the first time, saying that Nancy drowned after getting out of her kayak to swim. 
Her attorney told KTLA, quote, My client has, from the very beginning, done everything she can do to shed light on what happened and cooperate with giving whatever information that she has. The investigation by Guatemalan authorities is still ongoing. The prosecutor in charge of the case received a report saying that police were bribed in exchange for omitting Blazik's police statement and to keep Blazik out of custody. The allegations are currently being investigated by Guatemalan authorities. Jason Blair, NTD News. Investigators say that several Southern California residents planned a fake hit and run for an insurance scam and it was all captured on home security cameras. NTD's Christina Corona has more on the story. Five Southern California residents now face felony fraud charges in connection to a stage hit and run crash in Ontario, California in September 2021. The California Department of Insurance recently released security footage showing a light colored SUV stopping at an intersection followed by a dark colored SUV crashing into it at high speed. Both drivers can be seen calmly leaving the scene. The Inland Empire Automobile Insurance Fraud Task Force revealed the crash was staged and the individuals aimed to make a fraudulent insurance claim exceeding $30,000. The suspects have been identified as Priscilla Carmona Orajo, 29, of Fontana, Juan Barajas, 25, of Upland, Gabriela Cervantes, 52, of Rancho Cucamonga, Roberto Carlos Macias, 40, of Chino, and Humberto Ortiz, 32, of Ontario. Macias and Ortiz are the suspected drivers who fled, while Carmona Orajo claimed to be the hit and run victim. Barajas and Cervantes, owners of one of the vehicles, are accused of filing false police reports. All five were arrested in January. Christina Corona, NTD News, California. We have big news in the world of football. Jim Harbaugh, the man behind the Michigan's recent national championship victory, is leaving the Wolverines to filling as the head coach of the Los Angeles Chargers. Joining us now is NTD's Carlos Reyes with more on the story. So, Carlos, what can you tell us about this surprising move? Well, it's certainly a huge pickup for the Chargers, David. Jim Harbaugh, a name synonymous with success in both college and the NFL, is making his return to the professional ranks. The Chargers officially announced his move yesterday, revealing that Harbaugh's deal is a five-year commitment. Now, this isn't just any coaching gig. Harbaugh is heading to the Chargers, the team where he once played as a quarterback for two seasons back in 1999 to 2000. That's quite a homecoming for Harbaugh. But how would you think it prompted him to move back to L.A.? Well, according to owner Dean Spanos, the Chargers were not satisfied with their current state and felt the need for a new vision. Spanos emphasized that maintaining continuity without progress wasn't an option. Harbaugh, with his history of transforming struggling teams into contenders, emerged as a top choice. The urgency to win, coupled with Harbaugh's familiarity with the organization, made this move a logical one for the Chargers. Harbaugh has got quite a track record of success, particularly with San Francisco 49ers. Can we expect a similar turnaround for the Chargers now Harbaugh is at the helm? Well, I definitely believe so, David. When Harbaugh took over the 49ers, they were in a slump, missing the playoffs for eight straight seasons. His approach of instilling discipline and accountability quickly turned things around for the 49ers. Former 49ers tight end Delaney Walker mentioned on a podcast not too long ago that Harbaugh's no-nonsense attitude led to significant improvements on the field. For the Chargers, head coaching always seemed like the only thing holding them back. With Harbaugh, the team now has an identity and a proven voice they can rally behind. Now, what do you think is going to be the first order of business for Coach Harbaugh in L.A.? Well, David, one of his immediate challenges will be evaluating and potentially reshaping the entire roster from the ground up. The Chargers are currently projected to be $27.5 million over the league salary cap, presenting a significant hurdle. Harbaugh will have crucial decisions to make regarding key players with hefty cap hits. This includes outside linebackers Khalil Mack and Joey Bosa, as well as star receivers Keenan Allen and Mike Williams. Balancing the roster and managing the salary cap will be one of the top priorities for Harbaugh moving forward. Interesting dynamics at play there. Now the Chargers made the coaching move before securing a new general manager. Why is that? 
Well, David, to some it may seem a little bit confusing, but Harbaugh's history with the 49ers, marked by tension with management, could be a factor. The Chargers might want to ensure a harmonious relationship between the head coach and the general manager. They've already begun the search for a new GM, interviewing candidates with ties to Harbaugh. This strategic approach could be an effort to avoid conflicts that plagued Harbaugh's tenure with the 49ers. And finally, what can Charger fans expect in the upcoming NFL draft to support Justin Herbert and Harbaugh's vision? Well, David, right off the bat, the top priority for the Chargers in the draft will be likely surrounding Justin Herbert with more offensive firepower. With key playmakers aging or dealing with injuries, Harbaugh might aim to bolster the offense. Keep an eye out for potential targets like Washington's Roma Dunze or LSU's Malik Neighbors in the first round. Additionally, don't be surprised if Harbaugh looks at the Michigan pool for talent, possibly considering Wolverines receiver Roman Wilson in the later rounds to enhance the Chargers' offensive arsenal. Well, I'm sure Charger fans will be eager to see how Jim Harbaugh will lead their team to new heights. Thank you so much for your insight, Carlos. Of course, David. It's always my pleasure. All right. Stay tuned. Up next on China in Focus with Tiffany Meyer, retaliation against U.S. lawmakers promoting divisive content pretending to be American voters online. A look at how Beijing interfered in the U.S. elections. And that's all we've got for you tonight. We would like you to join us again on NTD Tonight every weekday at 9 p.m. I'm David Zhang. Have a wonderful evening.